On today's episode of Locked On Canucks, we look at game one of the Stanley Cup Finals and just how far the Vancouver Canucks are from contention. We take a look back at the 2017 NHL draft and how the Canucks probably got the second best player in that draft. And it's been 11 years since game seven of the 2011 Finals. How Vancouver of the city has evolved and we will never see what transpired that night ever happen again. It's Locked On Canucks, and it starts now. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Locked on Canucks. I'm, of course, your host, Justin Pooney. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day, a monumentous day in the city of Vancouver. And I'll get to that in a second, but I want to thank you for making Locked on Canucks your first listen of the day. Of course, this show keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. Um, We are available wherever you get your podcast services and are free, which is the most important. Please, you could also follow me on Twitter, underscore Process Sports, and our show at Locked On Canucks. And again, you can find us on YouTube as well for all the visual aspects, and you can like, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So before we dive into the hockey talk and the Canucks talk of the day, um, I want to give a big shout out and a big congratulation to everybody who is a citizen of Vancouver, a citizen of beautiful British Columbia. If you're listening anywhere else in the world and you're and you're from Vancouver and you know you are a Vancouverite, it was a big day in the sports landscape because once again our city is going to be up on the globe's biggest stage and once again we're going to be hosting a world-class sporting event as today FIFA announced their host cities for the 2026 joint World Cup bid between Canada, the United States, and of course, Mexico. And Vancouver, after just three years ago, the BC government said they were out, were announced as a host city for the 2026 FIFA World Cup alongside the likes of Seattle, LA, San Fran, Mexico City, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, New York, Miami, and of course, Toronto. But here's the biggest thing, the best part of the situation we can take away from it. The can, the sorry, the Canucks. BC is expected and Vancouver is expected to be a very prominent host of this World Cup and will host more games than Toronto because we have a bigger stadium. We can able to put more people in it, more money, but also. We are simply a beautiful city and, quite frankly, a world-class city. And as all of you know, as I've always said, the best city on the planet. So kudos to all the soccer fans in BC and sporting fans across British Columbia and Vancouver because the world's biggest sporting event is coming to the world's greatest city. And sticking in the world's greatest city with our hometown Canucks, Andre Kuzmenko apparently has met or is probably meeting with the Vancouver Canucks right now after he was in Edmonton where he got a signed Wayne Gretzky jersey. Now, does that mean he'll get a signed Pavel Bure jersey, potentially Henrik and Daniel Sedin involved in the recruiting thing? I don't know, but he is meeting with the Vancouver Canucks, and we will find out shortly on what the Russian winger's decision is. As I mentioned before, who knows? If the Canucks are one of the finalists, Pretty good situation to sign yourself up with. So we shall see what the Andre Kuzmenko sweepstakes look like. But I want to touch on game one of the Stanley Cup Finals, which transpired last night. And quite frankly, was an absolute brilliant hockey game to watch. I was telling a lot of friends that, quite frankly, are not the biggest hockey fans. If you watched that game last night and you did not um, know much about hockey, you'd be seeing the finest form of the game being played. The speed the skill, the puck position, the puck possessions, the precision passes, um, the physicality, you know, there's some pretty decent hits thrown out there, and the emotion. What you saw last night was the epitome of what this game is all about and the modern NHL. You see guys like Kale McCarr out there, Nathan McKinnon, Kucherov, Nikita Kucherov had an absolutely filthy, filthy, filthy assist. Um, it was, you know, guys like Valerie Nachushkin had a great game. 
Andre Vasilevsky had a rough first period, but shut the door after that, you know, and you saw Tampa claw back. You saw guys like uh, Mikhail Sergachev step up and what, and how does this relate to the Vancouver Canucks? Well, it's the prime indication just how far the Canucks have to go to can reach that level of contention. Now I said last week that the Canucks are Canada's best chance to win the Stanley cup. And I wholeheartedly still believe that. But when you look at the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Colorado Avalanche, the class of the NHL, the Canucks are far from the And why? Well, the Canucks have drafted elite high-end talent. We talked about, you know, Elias Pedersen, Thatcher Demko, Quinn Hughes. Um, those guys have elite-level talent. You know, they're the spine of the team that could be, you know, just as good as anybody else out there. Um, but the bad contracts, right? The Avalanche, they... It helped they got Nathan McKinnon on the cheap and they got some decent picks um, on the long term. But, you know, other than potentially like maybe Eric Johnson was the closest thing to a a anchor of a deal they have. The Canucks on their back end have three to four of them anchors on their deal. Of course, you have the Ekman Larson deal, the Myers deal. Although the Tucker Pullman deal is not an anchor money wise. It's still 2.5 million bucks for another three years. But the other thing um this team did the avalanche did was they determined what their core was and we're still figuring that out right now with the canucks especially under new management on what the core of this team is now we can all agree that we know who the the core starts with those four players but who are the next ancillary pieces that will fit in the next three to four thing um pieces that will fill out that core i believe it's bo horvat and i believe vasily pod colson is in that as well Brock Besser's contract situation, as we know, is very, very, very fluid. It looks like he's probably offered um, play that up for the next couple of years because he can make 15 in the next couple of years, um, which is probably more than he would make if he signed a long-term deal. And if the Canucks uh, were willing to go the term he probably wants, which I don't think all indications are currently they're not willing to go there just yet. Um, but that's the other thing. When you look at Tampa and Colorado, they identified their core pieces, their the immovable pieces. You know, with Tampa, it was Stamkos, Point, Kucherov, Hedman, Vasilevsky, right? You throw Pilot in there too, and Kalorn as those secondary pieces. But um, those guys were the core of that team. Now, you look back at that team in 2015 for Tampa that made the cup finals. The only guys left there are Hedman and Stamkos. But after that, they compiled all these other guys. The points you know, for their, de- their development with John Cooper – um, in the minor leagues, you know, Braden Point, um, Kucherov, um, you know, those, those other pieces I mentioned, they all grew up together. And that's how in Colorado, all these guys have grown up together. Landis Cog, McKinnon, um, McCarr is relatively new, but he's been a part of that core. Byram is a, a new member of that core. Rantanen. And they filled it with the right pieces. You know, trading Matt Duchesne was probably a brilliant, brilliant move. And the Canucks, quite frankly, are in a similar position, kind of where Matt Duchesne wanted out of Colorado and Joe Sackick refused to trade him um, unless he got equal value for him. And that's where JT Miller to time uh, falls in. The Canucks are not in a position where they have to trade him right now, but they can afford to wait a bit and make sure they get the best offer for JT Miller that not only sets them up for the future, but currently. When you look back at that Matt Duchesne trade, not only did they get the pick for Kale McCarr, but they got Samuel Girard in it. And then they got some other picks in it, but they got Samuel Girard, a top four defenseman on their team. And Kale McCarr, probably the best defenseman in the NHL for Matt Duchesne. And Matt Duchesne was a good player at this time in Colorado, but I think we all can admit Matt Duchesne was never an elite, elite player in the NHL. And JT Miller right now is, uh, was playing at an elite, elite level last year. And if you're able to hold off and get the right package for him and really, solidify that core pieces i think that's the way you go um so and again just the quality of play um the canucks you know they played a open style of game the second half of last year um but their team speed is nowhere near the lightning or colorado especially colorado and that is where i you look at where the game's going speed 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 you need speed in this league to be successful now and the canucks quite frankly don't have speed great team speed now you don't have, to have particularly fast guys but you also have to need guys that can move the puck up the ice at a rapid rate and not 
it doesn't take too long to break out of your own zone. When when the Canucks figure out how to build those pieces and and if that's the way they want to go and they built those right pieces on it, I'm absolutely certain this team will be back into contention. 100% of my mind. Um, so that's that. The Canucks, like I said, have a long way to go to reach the level of the Colorado Avalanche or Tampa Lightning, but there are good pieces here. There are the right pieces here, and we're going to touch on one of those pieces because we're going to look back at the 2017 NHL entry draft where the Canucks selected one of those members of their core. Uh, but first, before that, I want to talk to you guys about Built. You guys know our friends at Built are always coming out with a new amazing flavors. Well, this time, Built has truly outdone themselves with their new mud pie flavor. And for the first time ever, Built is introducing the new mud pie flavor in both mud pie bar and mud pie puff. I'm not sure what a mud pie is. Well, a mud pie, quite frankly, is absolute delicacy. The mud pie bar features... Uh, anything that you want as a chocolate fan, a whipped cream chocolate mousse smothered in 100% real chocolate and topped with cookies and cream crumble. You've got to try, uh, you've got to try the mud pie as soon as possible and you need to hurry because the mud pie bar and mud pie puff are only available for a limited time. Visit built.com to taste the deliciousness for yourself. Not convinced. Luckily we have saved the best for last. It's actually good for you. No, really all built products are low calorie, high protein and low sugar. Mud pie is packed with 16 grams of protein and only 150 calories and 8 grams of sugar. It's like your mom baked the most delicious creamy chocolate mud pie and wrapped it up just for you. Mud pie bars and puffs are available at Built.com right now, but they're going fast because they're delicious. Like all Built bars, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That means they're healthy and tasty. What's great about Built is that all bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. Eat something that tastes good and is good for you. You're going to want to have the new Mud Pie Built Bar and Built Puff, whether you need a snack or for your workout at late night treat or just something, a quick bite. It's perfect. It's perfect protein bar. It's amazing. The chocolate mousse, whipped cream, cookies, and cream crumble. Stop drooling. Go to Built.com to order your box of Mud Pie Bars and Puffs now. You won't regret it. And we have a special offer for you. The Mud Pie, for all the Mud Pie Bars and whatever, you go to Locked On. Excuse me. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off your order. Also, we have a special favor to ask all of you. And that is, we've put together a survey so we can learn more about listeners like you and make your favorite, um, so we can learn more about and make your favorite Locked On podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and don't like about Locked On podcast. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It won't take very long. And everyone that completes a survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards to take our audience survey. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Thank you for your help. So we are back. And as mentioned, we of course looked at the 2015 draft where the Canucks drafted Brock Besser. The 2016 draft where the Canucks took the biggest bust or one of the biggest busts in Canucks history, Ole Ulevi, when there was guys like Matthew Kachuk available, Jacob Chikrin, Charlie McAvoy, Mikhail Sergachev. The list goes on and on. But this draft right here, the 2017 NHL entry draft, which conclude which was concluded was at the conclusion excuse me of a tough tough season where the Canucks finished 30 49 and 43 and 9 for 69 points uh, by far the worst season I've ever witnessed as a Vancouver Canucks fan um, it was a season in which we saw the end of Henrik and Daniel Sedin um, Henrik and Daniel Sedin both had 15 goals apiece uh, Henrik had 50 points Daniel had 44 Paul Horvat scored 20 goals. Sven Berchi had 18. Brandon Sutter had 17. Marcus Granlin had 19 goals. Um, Nikita Triampkin uh, played 66 games. Uh, of course, we all remember the Michael Chapuz of the world. Um, of course, Alex Adler was still Troy Stetcher was still around. Um, it was it was a rough. Uh, Ryan Miller played 54 games. Uh, Jacob Markstrom played 26 games. Richard Bachman played five games. But regardless of that, the Canucks were gifted after that. Or not gifted, but given 
the fifth overall pick in the 2017 draft. Of course, the first two picks in that draft were Nico Heischer and Nolan Patrick. The later Nolan Patrick has let's quite struggled uh, in his NHL career so far, bouncing between Philadelphia and Vegas. Miro Heiskanen was taken uh, third overall, the defenseman from the Dallas Stars. Uh, then, of course, at number four, the guy who I quite frankly believe has got next as the next great NHL defenseman for decades to come, Kale McCarr, was taken out of the Alberta Junior Hockey League. Um, and then the Canucks, of course, were at number five, and we'll get to who they picked after that. Cody Glass was taken by Vegas. Elias Anderson, Casey Milstadt, Michael Rasmussen, Owen Tippett, Gabe Velarde, Cal Foote, Timothy Lilgren, you know, Philip Chittle, uh, Kyler Yamamoto. Um, so, you know, a interesting draft when you look at this draft about you know, was it five years now. Uh, you look at this draft and you see the players that have been selected and you see, um, quite frankly, how lackluster this draft was. I know when I was looking at the numbers of this draft, just when you look back in time, it just wasn't a very good draft. Now, look, Nico Heischer, you know, he's got 200 points, 78 goals, uh, 206 points in 300 games. I don't think we would say Nico Heischer um, is an elite, elite level player. Um, of course, we say that about Kale McCarr. He's an elite level player. But Nolan Patrick, as I mentioned, has struggled. Miro Heiskanen is a very, very solid defenseman. Um, but just for your guys' knowledge, you know who has the number one, the number one point producer from the 2017 draft is... Ladies and gentlemen, from your Vancouver Canucks, Mr. Elias Pettersson. And it's just a test to show you that the Canucks made the right decision because, of course, we would have loved Kale McCarr. But, of course, McCarr was selected by the Colorado Avalanche. I remember going to that draft. I wanted the Canucks to select McCarr. But, of course, there's the whole old U Levy situation. Uh, but Elias Pettersson was selected. And he was kind of a uh, a shocking pick. I know a lot of people in Vancouver wanted him, the Canucks to take Cody Glass. But... Um, the Canucks made the absolute right decision in taking Elias Pettersson. Uh, absolute stud of a player when healthy. Uh, the skill sets are all there. Of course, in his rookie year, 28 goals, 66 points. And then again, in 1920, 66 points in 68 games. Um, of course, then he had a, a 18 points in 17 playoff games. This year, once again, a slow start, but we saw Elias Pettersson pick it up in the second half of the year with a career-high 32 goals and for 68 points, another career-high. And then, he, of course, we all know he won the Calder Memorial Trophy as Rookie of the Year. Um, but that is the thing. Elias Pettersson is not a superstar yet. He's been an all-star, but we all know he has the superstar it factor. He's got the shot. He's got the hands. He can play 200-foot game. It's just a matter of him staying healthy, continuing to get stronger. Now, remember, when Elias Pettersson came in, everybody was so worried about his weight um, and can he handle you know, the physicality of the NHL. Well, it takes a few years um, for these young athletes to grow into their man bodies. You know, He came in as a light guy, but he's now 23 years old, um, and he's, you know, He's going to grow into his man body, not only get bigger and stronger, but when you look at Henrik and Daniel Steen, they weren't massive, you know, jacked guys, right? They were strong and they had a strong core, a strong balance. And I see Elias Pettersson following that same trend. And that's why we have Henrik and Daniel Steen in the player development field will be so helpful because guys like Elias Pettersson who, you know, are slight, they can learn how to be strong in their own different aspects. And I see the sky's the limit with Elias Pettersson. And as I mentioned that nausea before, if the Canucks want to take that next step, they need Elias Pettersson to take that next step as a player to go from, you know, a guy who can get you, you know, 30 goals to 70 points to a guy that can get you 40, 35, 40 goals to, you know, 75 to, you know, sorry, 80, 80 plus points to become a how if he takes that next step, that allows everybody else in the Canucks to take a little bit of less weight and then play a game more freely. Guys like J Bo Horvat won't have to score 30 goals. Although he's capable of scoring 30 goals, and it'd be awesome for him to score 30 goals, he could potentially focus more so on a defensive role and play more of a balanced game. But definitely when you look back at the 2016 draft, another moment in Jim Benning's draft history where he made the right decision in drafting Elias Pettersson. So that is that for a look back at the team draft because quite frankly... There's not much to go further on about that because the Canucks made the right decision. But coming up after this last break, it's been, as I mentioned, 11 
years since the Vancouver Canucks um, made it to the Stanley Cup Finals. And Game 7 was just a year, 11 years ago to the date yesterday. So I'm going to look back at the that game, what transpired after the game, and how it will never happen again. <clears throat> and to Locked on Canucks, the show that, of course, keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. So talked about the Canucks' current situation, looked back at the Canucks' former draft. So let's look at a moment in time I know I talked about Vancouver history that was made today with them getting the ability to host the FIFA World Cup. But let's look back at, quite frankly, the darkest moment in Canucks, maybe Canucks, the darkest moments uh, or one of the dark sports history in Vancouver City history, um, June 15th of 2011. It was a sunny, sunny, beautiful day. Um, it was warm. I remember living, you know, getting up in the morning. It was a beautiful day. Birds were chirping. Grass was kind of burnt because it was a warm summer that year. Um, and thinking this is the day the Vancouver Canucks are going to win the Stanley Cup. Game seven of the Stanley Cup finals. The Canucks, of course, were shellacked in game six by Boston. But coming home, game seven against the Boston Bruins to clinch their first Stanley Cup on their 40th season. A memorable season. And... That's where all the good times ended that morning because after that, the game we all know was a disaster. But after that, another riot ensued. Of course, I wasn't born during 94, but I witnessed the 2011 riots. I sat in front of my TV, tears in my eyes about this team, but also seeing the city that I love, the city that you know helped shape me who I am, be basically set on fire and burned and looted. Um, it was... It was a tough time, and then Vancouver got a rep for being a no-fun city for years after because of the subsequent riot. So looking back at it, those people weren't true Canucks fans. Those people were there to cause anarchy. Those people there were not um, people that you would associate as real Canuck fans, real Vancouver rights. Those are people that just wanted to sound and have an excuse to cause havoc in a city and basically act like idiots. Now, we all remember that famous photo that went uh, worldwide uh, of that couple kissing on the ground during the riot. Uh, that might have been one of the only shining moments of it. But then again, uh, who knows why they were on the ground there. Um, so looking back at that, it was a dark moment in Canucks history. It was a dark moment um, in Vancouver history. And I am a firm believer that the next time the Canucks ever get in that position, it will never happen again. Um, not only because we've learned, hopefully, we have learned. Um, as I mentioned on a previous episode a little while ago, once the Canucks make the playoffs, now that all these um, other leagues and teams are doing these viewing parties, it's smart business for the Canucks to do a viewing party, but do it in a controlled setting where they control everything. Not the city of Vancouver, not the province of British Columbia, where the Canucks control it. Where they have it, they set it up. They can sell their merchandise. They can sell their liquor, but they have their security. They have their own security access points. They have security checks. They have police on deck. And it is done through a way where, you know, you have to apply to get a ticket. You have to do something of that nature, not where 100,000 people can just congregate um, on Camby Street and then just have these couple big signs. It needs to be controlled. And I think once Vancouver makes the playoffs again, you will see a better plan in place. And when they make an extended run, which I believe will be sooner rather than later, you're going to see not only a more fun environment, a more safe environment, but you're going to see real Canucks fans be put on display and just how special we are. Um, and like I said, that was a dark time in Canucks history, but I see the organization learning from it, especially Francesco Acolini owning it. And seeing just the black market put on our city, I see that changing. And I see Francesco Aquilini and the Canucks next time, next year when they make the playoffs, um, have a better situation. Of course, we know Scott Road is definitely going to be lit. But that is all the time we have today for Locked on Canucks. I want to thank you for, once again, making Locked on Canucks your first listen. Tomorrow, we will have, it's Friday, potential more updates on the Kuzmenko situation, whatever's going on in Canucks land. And we'll take a look at the 2018 NHL draft for the Vancouver Canucks. But now, make your second listen uh, of Locked on NHL. Locked on NHL covers the playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from local experts every Monday through Friday. It's free. 
and available wherever you get your podcasts. Take care, guys. Stay safe. And we will talk to you tomorrow.